So I was very impressed this morning with that picture of, of the development of the brain and that steep climb in the beginning. We're born with all the neurons and all the synapses develop. And then there's that long decline at the end, which is a little depressing. <laughs> this panel is really thinking about what's going on with all those synapses with adolescence. And, and in, in three out of four cases with regard to formal school learning goals. And one of the things I want to point out by way of framing, I study mathematics education research. And our goals as a society have advanced dramatically in what we want kids to be able to know and do in mathematics. Turn back 100 years ago, shopkeeper arithmetic was the common goal. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, you're good. Now we expect all kids to learn algebra. We want them to be able to make conjectures, to form arguments, to critique reasoning, to justify, to model with mathematics. And these are complex skills. And so this panel, in part, will be looking at kids, how kids learn with technology, and how the technology may help them or challenge them in addressing some of the, in, in learning some of these complex skills. Our panelists are Naomi Barron, Mimi Ito, John Payne, and Jim Pellegrino. They'll shortly each introduce themselves, and they're going to talk without PowerPoint <laughs> for about five minutes about their research and some of the issues and challenges as they see them. And we have a, we have a, a plan for the session that involves them talking for five minutes each discussion among the panel, and then we're going to involve our graphic facilitator, Peter. We're going to ask you as an audience to generate ideas and issues that you think should be part of this. And rather than addressing those one by one as question and answer, we're going to get them up as a kind of mind map and ask our panelists to discuss the mind map as it evolves. <laughs> so be prepared that we're really looking for your active participation in contributing issues that you think should be on the map at this point in the day. OK, with that introduction, let me turn to Naomi to start us off. And we'll just go down and give us five minutes about your perspective. Thank you kindly. Uh, I sound like a frog. I am actually not a frog. I'm a human being. Uh, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I also am an odd person now. It's because I may be the only linguist in this group. So the perspective that I'm going to be giving you is from the research that I have done with the background that I have in linguistics. Uh, I'm at American University in Washington, DC. I've been very interested for a oh, good 25, 30 years in the ways in which language is influenced by technology. I spent about 15 years or so trying to figure out whether so-called computer-mediated communication or then electronically mediated communication, communication, hint, that means adding in mobile phones, is affecting the way we speak and write. The bottom line is the media really want to hear about how these uh, uh, new, new media are sending language to hell in a handbasket. Uh, there are very few changes that are directly related to the technology. Rather, the technology is augmenting the kinds of social changes that were already at work, the major one of which is making things more informal in our spoken and written communication. The work that I've been doing for the last oh, seven or eight years focuses on reading, the question of whether the ways that we read on screens, name your favorite kind of screen, whether it's a laptop, a, a, a tablet, <coughs> or an e-reader, or a mobile phone, is different from the way we read in print, and if it is different, whether the continuing use and the growing use of digital media for reading are changing the nature of what it means to read. I've done some cross-national studies using uh, it's university students, but I'll bet you if we looked at middle school or high school, we'd find something extremely similar. I'll give a little bit of data from Scholastic in just a moment about that. Uh, I gather data from the United States, Germany, Japan, Slovakia, and India. That's where I have friends who help me collect the data. Uh, and what I found was this. When I asked what is the medium, whether it's a screen or whether it is print, and I looked at all kinds of different screens, I could check whichever they want, the medium on which you concentrate best. Simple question, where do you concentrate best? When you average together all the countries, 92% of the students, and these were 18 to 24, 26 year olds, depending upon the country, 92% said, I concentrate best when I read in print. This is despite the fact that educators, such as my, at my university, work really hard to get students to read digitally. Similarly, I asked if the price were the same, because cost is one of the reasons that digital reading, think e-books, think e-textbooks in particular, 
the reason that electronic books have been growing so much in their usage. So I asked students, if cost were the same, which medium would you prefer for reading? For reading for schoolwork, for reading for pleasure. And depending upon the country, somewhere between 89 and 90% of the students said, if cost were the same, I go for print. Hmm, this is not what I anticipated finding. If something is long, they would prefer to read it in print. Short, we read a lot of short stuff on screens. That didn't seem to matter so much. Then I asked about multitasking, a topic that keeps arising and will arise more at this conference, uh, particularly in the United States. An enormous amount of multitasking when you were reading on a screen, less so when you're reading in print, although as one student wisely pointed out to me, I can have print but my phone next to me. Guess what, I can multitask. Okay, I said that there are other studies that are done with younger kids. Scholastic, the publisher, has done some studies roughly every two years uh, on kids and families and reading. And what they have basically found is, if you look at six to uh, 17 year olds, they'll say they always believe they will be reading some print. Let me just talk a little bit, uh, two sentences, about the opportunities that I think digital reading has and some of the challenges. The opportunities are obviously democratization. There are a number of projects, particularly in so-called third world countries, I think Africa or India in particular, uh, World Reader, which is making books electronically, but books available to people who don't have it via their mobile phones. Obviously, there are the convenience factors, the functionality, you can look things up on dictionary and so forth online. The major challenge that I see with digital reading, and the students tell me this, is they can't concentrate. They multitask, they go to a hyperlink, and then suddenly they're off somewhere else and their mind is not there. Uh, students tell me that print is real reading. Students tell me that it takes longer to read in print than it does to read online, even if it's the same number of words. And they tell me that print is boring because you don't always have these interruptions you do when you're reading digitally. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mimi Ito, and uh, just for the disciplinary diversity, we're the disciplinary <laughs> diversity panel. I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I hang out with kids on the internet, play games with them, and try to really understand the online world, games, uh, mobile media from a youth perspective. Uh, and trying to understand uh, both how they are creating innovative new practices, uh, living and learning uh, uh, in new ways, and I also try to translate that in ways that the grown-up world uh, might understand and appreciate. And uh, as so I've done a lot, you know, large collaborative ethnographic studies of uh, young people and various forms of learning in largely recreational and social contexts. So, uh, you know, especially when I started the research, most of what was happening was in the out of school space. So we were really focused on that more uh, informal learning environment. Of course, that's changed uh, over the past uh, 10 years that I've been doing this research. And most recently, I'm chair of the MacArthur Foundation's Connected Learning Research Network, which is really trying to mine the, what we know about how young, uh, young people are living and learning with digital media and making it uh, a more productive focus for learning, education, and intergenerational connection. So just at a very high level, you know, the findings of my research uh, is, uh, you know, there's two things really that are kind of cross-cutting themes. One is uh, the fact that, you know, the, the dominant mode of learning for young people these days is really transitioning into this more informal, demand-driven uh, network kind of learning that's happening in uh, a much more fluid, social, peer-based environment because they are growing up in an environment of absolute abundance, right, of information and social connection, which is a very different environment from when our educational institutions were founded, which were uh, premised on a theory of scarcity <laughs> to these of these very things. So, uh, you know, the, the reality is that the, this, the dominant mode of more like in the moment, I Google it, I find a YouTube video, I connect with a friend, you know, this is how kids are learning. And that shift, that shift has been really progressing quite dramatically during the years that I've been doing my research. And the related uh, finding is that there's a culture clash between the modes and institutions of learning that were perfected in a very different kind of information environment and the modes 
of learning that young people are immersed in today, and it's mirrored in not just our educational institutions, but a generation gap, which is something that Elizabeth alluded to, uh, between how adults and young people view the value of uh, their digital environments, where young people will generally say they see the internet as a lifeline to social connection and information, uh, where gaming is the dominant entertainment medium of our time, uh, you know, versus adults who even when more and more uh, grown-ups are using <laughs> social media, uh, actually their suspicion and contempt for teen use of those same media have remained remarkably resilient <laughs> despite the fact uh, that they may be using those same tools themselves. So I think, uh, the, the um, I'll, moving to the opportunity piece with the connected learning model that we've been trying to develop, we're really trying to say what kind of things could we do to sort of work across this, you know, contempt and hostility that we're seeing intergenerationally, because it comes from the kids too, right? They poo-poo, the grown-up use, like grown-ups don't get it, you know, I read, wrote a 100-page fan fiction, but I'm not a writer, I'm not a reader, I mean, they've just, you know, it, it goes both ways that, you know, our connected learning model is really saying, look, there is this incredible opportunity here to uh, foster, uh, you know, learning that is student-centered, that's focused on young people's interests, that is supported socially, uh, if we can get adults, and I think in the last panel too, some really great examples, like what Lynn was suggesting, uh, to actually listen, engage, be part of that world. And, you know, we have some really great examples of how kids, whether it's through gaming or fandom or other kinds of youth interests that are activated online, are uh, able to connect that to their career opportunity, their schooling, and so on. And um, I'll end with just my cautionary note, which is, you know, I think the biggest risk out there is really a question of equity. So we're living in a world of personalization where young people's experiences of this environment are radically divergent and getting more and more divergent. And they're stratifying, at least in terms of learning, around really predictable forms of social economic inequity where, you know, the kids who are creative class kids who are fully supported and blah, blah, blah in progressive schools, they have superpowers <coughs> right now. And the kids who aren't, it is a form of distraction or, you know, it's, it, it can be, a, you know, a detraction from learning and opportunity and so on. Uh, and that's a really gross generalization, but the fundamental thing is that we can't make blanket statements anymore about the effects of media on children. We just can't, because the world, the way that they can navigate these worlds, personalize them and customize them are so varied. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Payne from RAND. I study education technology, specifically looking at uh, use of education technology in schools for entire school years and looking at the effects on academic achievement. So um, we also collect a lot of implementation data on how the, the uh, technology is being implemented, but the main focus is on increasing or testing whether these technologies increase student achievement. So uh, the, the comments I have to offer are really focused on academic benefits or harms. Um, and with that, I'd like to just walk through a few, uh, maybe three interpretations of the results from my own research as well as other studies that are similar to that. And the first thought is that if harm comes from, if academic harm is going to come from deploying education technologies, it's probably going to be some form of underuse or uh, poor use of resources. So the most important being the student's time and attention. If te the technology is not engaging the student in good instructional content, if they get distracted or something uh, is not really engaging them, then it's unlikely to be beneficial and it could be harmful. Similarly, if it doesn't make good use of teacher time, it's a problem. Teachers are very useful and an important part of student education, and if teachers are wasting their time uh, trying to fix technology or get it to work, then they're not really using their skills well. But it also can be things like financial resources. If a, a district buys a lot of technology without a good plan to deploy it, 
the, the resources that they used to do that uh, might be taken from something else that would have been more productive. The second thing is that the research that we do is focused on whether technology improves <coughs> academic achievement. And if a technology, if, if the result of a research study is no significant positive effect, that can be viewed as a disappointment. But I don't think that it should always be viewed as a disappointment because some ty types of technology might be good replacements for others even if they don't actually inc incrementally improve achievement. Say, for example, I don't think this study has been done, but if uh, digital textbooks work just as well as paper textbooks and they're easier to carry home in a backpack or whatever, then it, benefits could accrue even if we don't see them in academic achievement. There's a lot of uh, apps and technologies out there, very few of them are undergoing this sort of long-term evaluation. And so using these thoughts as a way of you know, sort of eyeballing whether something is going to be helpful or at least not harmful might be useful. The third uh, major observation is that when we do see that these technologies have positive effects, they are most often uh, uh, models where the teacher is very engaged in the process. So it is not a situation where students are working on their own on computers without the involvement of teachers. Teachers are integral in these successful technologies. And finally, there's a lot of personalization in those su successful technologies. That is, having students work on material where they uh, come to the problem and not forcing them along uh, to learn things that they're not ready for. So uh, giving them the opportunity to be challenged at an appropriate level and to experience success and to build fundamental skills before going on to more complex things. In the last minute, I just want to briefly uh, put out maybe an opportunity and, and an accompanying challenge that, that comes with uh, these observations. And that is that personalization seems like a high leverage idea in terms of improving education. But it's difficult to scale because if you think about a classroom where kids might be working on different things every day, uh, it, it's a very challenging problem and so for teachers to manage and to really be sure that the kids are working on the right thing. That, I think, is where technology can really help. It is in managing the process of education. Whether or not the technology is also delivering instruction, I think, is less of a critical question than the, the capabilities it might have to manage the process and make it so that we can personalize the experiences for all children and really move them as far along as is possible given their, the, where, where they're starting and, and their interests and abilities. The challenge, sorry, I'm running out of time, but the, the challenge with that is that personalization at a very large scale it, it will confront many uh, aspects of um, policies and procedures that are in place in schools right now that make that difficult. The most obvious being end of year tests where teachers are responsible for kids to uh, demonstrate certain skills at the end of the year. And if we're going to allow more flexibility, we need to think about those policies as well. Good afternoon. I'm, uh, Jim. Uh, I'm Jim Pellegrino from uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago. I'm a cognitive psychologist, and I co-direct the Learning Sciences Research Institute uh, at UIC. Um, and I think my comments will sort of connect with uh, John's in terms of some of the issues about technology and media use in schools. First, I think one of the things is, is to realize that there's tremendous inequities out there in, in addition to a very big disconnect between the technologies that kids have access to outside of school and in home and the technologies that actually get used in school and the distribution of that across demographic groups in schools. So we have a, 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 a very big challenge, which is um, when we think about what technology and media can do, which I'll say, uh, talk about in a minute, um, we, we actually see a sort of increase in inequities in terms of the out, potential outcomes of education. Now, I, I tend to study things in the area of STEM education. I've been working in mathematics and science education, both curriculum and instruction and the assessment side including the, you know, the, the dreaded large-scale assessments. I don't, I don't develop them, but I advise groups that are trying to do better by them. Let me put it that way, and I'll comment about assessment uh, as part of this. 
one of the things that's really important to understand is that researchers like myself and Jeremy and others have figured out ways in which digital media and technology can actually create very powerful learning environments or contribute to powerful learning environments in terms of what kids can do in terms of engaging with content mathematically, scientifically, uh, in terms of social, um, social historical data. And there's lots of examples we have of developing uh, materials that used in a classroom, in group settings, interaction with teacher mediation produce very powerful outcomes for kids in terms of understanding deep issues like social migration, census data, um, inequities, um, deep understanding of scientific concepts and principles, understanding things like mathematical functions in algebra, um, and creating the context for the kinds of knowledge that we actually expect of all kids now if you look at our new standards in math and English language arts and reading. So, we, know how, we can, in fact, develop very powerful digital media that can work as a part of school. But I, one of the things that's very important, we heard it earlier today, we have to harness the principles of learning, stuff that we know from, comes from the learning sciences in terms of designing those things. It's not just porting stuff over into technology. There are better and worse ways to do this that recognize other aspects of the social, social community of classroom and learning and that take advantage of, of that learning as a fundamentally a social process, not an individual isolated one. So that's one of the, the things that I think we have. That's a, that's a challenge. It's also an opportunity because as we build those environments, we have a hard time getting them into schools and getting them into places where teachers can use them effectively. The other I just want to sort of say is in the area of assessment. We, we remain wedded to a paper and pencil technology, which is, you know, it is, it is somebody once said it's 19th century psychology, um, and we have much more powerful ways to actually design assessments that can get at student thinking and reasoning and that can be used productively in the education environment, something along the lines that you were saying about personalization and giving teachers quality information. We can also do it at a large scale level, and I just want to make one last comment. We can use technology and media to adapt to the needs of a variety of special needs learners in ways that we never could before, and that extends all the way into the world of large scale assessment. So there's enormous opportunities there, you know, using what we know from the learning sciences about building effective learning environments. We have a lot of challenges in terms of the design and implementation and preparing the education workforce teachers to use those things productively in schools, transforming even the nature of teaching as it is oftentimes viewed on the part of educators. Thank you. So I'll ask a few questions of the panel and then we're going to open it up as we mm -hmm. mentioned to all of you. You know, each in your own way, I think you mentioned something about what kids have outside school and what they have inside school. Are, they, are kids experiencing disconnects or connections between these? What do you think school leaders need to know about the kids as they go back and forth across these boundaries? What do they need to know about technology and about kids? Uh, let me start with that, with the other hat that I wear. I run the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning, and we're trying to figure out to what extent is using technology in all aspects of our curriculum, the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do. What students often tell us is just because we're on our devices all the time, including in your class when you're lecturing or we're doing group work or whatever it is, doesn't mean we necessarily want to be doing that in class. Mm -hmm. Just because I use Facebook or I use WhatsApp doesn't mean I want you to be using it with me. <laughs> so the kind of conversation that needs to take place, and it's really got to happen, and I'm speaking from a university perspective, but my guess is the same is going to be true at least in high schools and maybe middle schools as well, is to have that kind of conversation between the teacher and the students to say, how are we going to communicate? What kinds of things do you want to do? What kinds of things do you not want to do? Because there will be some differences from class to class, from subject area to subject area. But we have assumed that there's a kind of one model fits all. You allow classrooms to have laptops, you don't allow them to have it, whatever the case may be. And it's much more specialized to that particular class. Anyone here who's ever taught the same class in two sections in the same semester and seen it's a different people, it's a different yeah. dynamic. I think we need to take that lesson to heart with regard to technology. Yeah, 
I would really build on that. And you know, when I talk to whether it's educators or parents, you know, it's really not about bringing the technology into the classroom. It's about recognizing the tremendously new opportunities for learning that exist outside of the classroom and leveraging those. So when we talk to educators and parents, we say it's not that you know you have to be on Twitter or something, but it is that you want to be aware and brokering opportunities, whether it's you know finding a you know online class or you know building something uh, in uh, a, a, an online community or so on. You're you want to recognize and broker and understand that you know the importance, the value that the adults are. Uh, providing in a lot of our successful cases of connected learning is exactly about this brokering. It's not about pushing information, but it's about brokering to appropriate kinds of opportunities and helping shape and focus attention in appropriate ways for young people. So that's a real mind shift for a lot of educators. Of course, you you know, especially as a university, it's like expertise, knowledge, these things. I'm not saying they're not important, but the role of the educator needs to uh, encompass this brokering and connection building much more and has probably less of an emphasis in the era of the MOOC and the flipped classroom in delivering expertise. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we talk about, you know, a lot of, it's not baked into the educational mission of a lot of programs, this kind of brokering mm -hmm. role. Um, and then the second thing I'll say is, you know, I think this uh, speaks to some of what we heard in the earlier panel too, but. I do think that there are different kinds of capacities that we have to foster in young people in order to thrive in the digital age. So they need to uh, develop the capacity for self-regulation, for wise learning choices, for being able to be mindful and attentive in appropriate ways. And it's actually counterproductive, some of the institutional strategies which were uh, which are focused on the sort of external institutionalized adult-driven regulation and control actually doesn't help kids develop those capacities, <laughs> right? Like it, it can be very well-meaning, but you know they have to learn to control and regulate themselves. And I don't think we have that emphasis either in our parenting or in our educational institutions to really say, look, you know. They've got to learn really early how to manage their identity in public. They have to learn to turn things off. Uh, they have to learn how to self-regulate, how to manage these very complex kinds of social relationships that they're having access to much earlier in life. And you know, I'm a parent, I'm an educator, and I don't think we've been doing a good job of that. You guys want to talk more to that, or is that enough on that topic? I, just one thing I wanted to add. I, among you know, kids are, are you know a swim in a sea of media and, re, and sources. So, you know, and, and they can Google anything. But one of the things that we can do uh, as parents, as grandparents, and and as educators is is help them in the context of some of the things we want them to use the media and the technology for 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 school activities is to be critical analytic consumers of information to learn to make judgments and that's a part of this yeah. th this regulatory yeah. process realizing that now that you have so much access to so much information what's good information what's credible information how do you adopt a stance that uh, helps you become really an intelligent consumer of the many, many messages that are being thrown at you by advertisers or whoever, including the nature of what's a persuasive argument and what's a legitimate argument, what's an evidence-based argument. Oh, right. you One got, of the... Go ahead.
kinds of things we want to see kids doing with media. You know, we, we heard some examples of, of tasks which are maybe not so good for kids <laughs> earlier and throughout the day, like maybe watching something passively is less good. And we saw some nice examples of maybe just, just a glimpse of kids moving blocks along an iPod pad, maybe that's better. But what kind of tasks should we be asking our children to do with technology that would really advance deep learning goals, especially as they're adolescents? What can they do that would be productive use of their time with technology? Well, in the case of the technologies that, that we're studying, in particular the personalized learning strategies, as kids become older, I'm not sure this applies to, to very young kids, but having them take a little bit more uh, control over what they're going to do on a given day. If there's a set of things that they need to learn, giving them more agency and choosing that, and maybe even choosing if there are several instructional options available to, to pick among those, could really get them more involved. You know, these systems collect a lot of data that, as Jim mentioned, can be uh, very useful to the teacher to understand how kids are doing, which kids are experiencing similar problems. But that data can also be shared with the child so that they can see how they're doing and start to see how they're growing and, and the, the gratification that comes with uh, seeing that success. So I think you know, one use that I think falls out of this personalization idea is greater engagement in the whole learning process, not just being you know, there and you know, doing what the teacher says, but being more involved in it more choices, but also getting feedback about it. It sounds like not just making choices, but getting feedback That's about right. their choices. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we talk a lot in the current literature about 21st century skills, problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, uh, media literacy, et cetera. And one of the things that we have to recognize is where do you develop those skills? And, and in, in essence, one of the issues is you develop those skills in some rich content-based problems and situations. So we can't abandon that and just sort of say we're going to create great problem solvers because that's, that's, a, that's a myth in, in generality. There's no, there's no cognitive uh, science basis for that <laughs> assumption. Um, but, but the point I want to get at is, is that what, what technology and media can do is to create environments that engage kids in the kinds of rich thinking and argumentation and looking at evidence and, and constructing um, productive arguments with each other about why something might be a better answer and engage in that kind of collaborative critical thinking and problem solving in the context of the kinds of, of, uh, of things that are represented in the current standards. And that's true in science. You know, Jeremy, back in the 90s, we did that in, in a thing called The Adventures of Jasper yeah. Woodbury. Right. Um, we actually used video media to create what some people call the world's biggest word problem. Um, <laughs> we all hated word problems, right? Uh, it's the dreaded thing. But, but it's because that's the way we've taught mathematics problem solving, and it doesn't work. But if you, cre if you create an interesting problem context, kids will be engaged. They will work individually and in groups. They will solve a very complicated problem and then be willing to show what they've learned to, to adults. Um, and, and so we can create the kind of environments that foster the very skills that we're talking about in terms of this argument about 21st century competencies. Yeah, and just, just to build on that, I mean, you mentioned the sort of social give and take that happens when people work on complex problems together. So one of the leading indicators that I look at is, and this is specific to the teen group, so I'll, I'll uh, with that caveat, is whether they are, uh, you know, in their online lives, whether they are participating or becoming involved in affinity groups that really value learning and expertise. So there's a lot of ways that kids can participate online. But where we find the most sort of resilient or what we call connected learning is when young people are in an authentic community that is uh, focused on creative production around uh, you know, a deep interest in some area. And it is a huge opportunity space for the kids who, you know, if you're interested, you're, you, if, you know, most of what kids are interested, there isn't a local community that's really going to support that. So there's suddenly this incredible opportunity space for kids who are interested in, you know, some special topic or some niche fandom or some uh, engineering phenomena, you know, they can find those communities online. And most of those communities have, you know, competitions, problems are solved. Like it is like uh, there's sort of a 
problem solving or creative production task that's embedded in all of these high functioning groups. And we have them as professionals, right? We have our affinity networks and we learn <laughs> from our peers and we get pushed by peers yeah. who are fellow experts and pushing at us and they want that experience too. And the internet has really expanded that opportunity space for kids. Go on to the other question, please. Okay, good. Yeah, so sure. what we'd like to do at this point, actually, is we're going to uh, take a break from this format. I'd like you to take a moment to turn to people near you and think about what, what is being talked about here, but also what you've heard during the day. And let's just name some issues that we want to get on a board for further discussion. <laughs> and what I'm going to ask is not for long questions or long comments, but for just short names of issues. And Peter is going to help us with a mind map of some of these issues. <laughs> so please take uh, two or three minutes, talk among yourselves, and let's see if we can get some issues up on the board. <laughs> A mind map, I love mind maps. <laughs> so what we'd like now is for you just to name some issues or questions in a brief statement. We want to try to get a, a large set of issues. So please try to, to make your comments or names of the issues short. And Peter's going to capture them, and then we'll discuss them. So will someone set us off? Yeah, start us off. Want to discuss more about personalization? kids mindfulness and skills to let them take a break and pause. Go ahead. I hear a lot about promise, very little about the perils of tech. I'm a pediatric occupational therapist. I work in schools. I do workshops with teachers. There's a lot <coughs> going on right now with um, industry-driven research pushing all this tech and not really listening to you know, Naomi saying, you know, 92% of these kids can't focus or concentrate when they're looking at a screen. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're fueling attention deficit by using these devices so uh, prolifically through the schools. We're not really knowing um, in the absence of the teacher, can this device actually teach your children, right? There's so much more research that needs to be done, yet there's a pull-out, roll-out right down to K. And even so this, the, that's our attention between so change and research. So we have to look at the perils. And, and this person just mentioned, teachers have quit teaching children to print, OK? So they're not teaching them to print. Yet, right after grade seven, they stick paper in front of them and a pencil. They say, do your spelling test, do your math. These kids don't know how to print. Like, I've seen output speeds, four to five year delays in output speeds. They don't even know how to, you know, they're between four and seven, failing in math, yet we then put them on a computer program that makes them attention deficit. You know, it's just, it's crazy what's going on in the schools. So we need to look at the perils. Of the, look at the, the perils of technology in schools. Go ahead. So, um, just a minute. You know, where is it, you know, is there truly capacity for that? And what structural, whether it would be policy or technology or institutional changes, can, you know, might be kind of helpful for parents and schools and communities to um, make self, <coughs> not put so much um, on the individual kid to um, have to moderate their own. Right, so where, where's the responsibility lie for kids? <laughs> Institutions. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, just quickly, the uh, the problem. This is in the context of the classroom. 
the problem of um, the, the, the classroom being a social space, mm -hmm. and does digital media in any way support that? And if not, why not? Okay. So uh, how do we use technology to make classroom social, respect their socialness? Rather than kind of breaking that up maybe into individualization. Go ahead. I think one of the things that we're missing is as we change schools along this digital model, where is the place for role modeling, for teachers to be role modeling? Where is the place for, uh, for attachment? I mean, some of my most visited experiences going through school was one teacher yeah. or two teachers that I, I formed a relationship or had an experience watching them and learned learn so much that isn't going to be easily academically uh, testable, but is something that uh, was a valuable experience for yeah. shaping the kinds of person that I am eventually became. Where is so the teachers, is teachers as role models, and what, what roles are they modeling? And attachment. Something about music at risk, we're talking about self-control and the different tasks that children need to know how to do
principles of science of learning. And, and for the mediated me and mentor to consider not just parents, not just the educators, but also um, this is taken from Lisa, Lisa Guernsey's idea of sort of bringing in um, librarians as another resource of, of people who are actually trained in information oh, science for information. And, for, and, and information brokers to sort of bring them into the um, educational space as well. Yeah, let's get two more and then we'll have a discussion. So okay. can, can you get up and uh, you can, so everybody can uh, hear? I think we need to understand much more deeply and from a developmental science perspective how and why interactive media is so compellingly motivated for good and bad reasons. I mean, we talk about the massive amount of usage and the worry about the addiction and the capacity to use this possibly. And I think we have lots of ideas and theories about how and why <coughs> the and motivation system. So I think we need to understand that more deeply for both the good and bad reasons. So unpacking motivation, understanding motivation more deeply, and one more in the top. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would put the phrase mind wandering up on the map because it is, you know, for, for two reasons. I mean, one is that in terms of learning, so, you know, or, um, or social and emotional development, et cetera, there's pretty good evidence that mind wandering is not just, you know, distraction. It's not, it's not self evidently a bad thing. It actually can be, can have all the positives. Um, and that the same things that erode our capacity, the, the same technologies that erode our capacity to, attention, or to pay attention also erode our ability to engage in what are past independent inward thinking. And that so sort of improving the one um, can improve the other. Whether this is something you want to spend a lot of time doing in schools is, you know, there's, there's obviously a bias for action. You don't want kids to sort of zone out and try to teach them stuff. But if you want them to be better people, if you want them to be more thoughtful, this is something not to, you know, run over. So. Thanks. So now I'm going to ask our panelists to have a look at this board and maybe the cluster or corner of the board that you'd like to comment on or dive more into where we could you know, speak to some of the issues. I've got two, and I'll start with mind wandering, and then if we want to wait, yeah, yeah. I'll do the other one. The issue with digital technologies, which can be extremely distracting, is when your mind wanders, it doesn't wander freely, by which I mean it gloms onto the next thing to focus on. So to come back to the research that I've done, on, so, uh, a reading in, on, on digital screens versus reading in hard copy, Part of the problem with reading on digital screens is they urge us to keep going. Whereas in principle, in print, you can stop and think about something and maybe go get a cup of coffee or wander around the room as opposed to go check Facebook status updates. So I think part of the problem that, that we need to address in terms of how we teach people to do productive mind wandering is not to go to something that is structured that takes up your mind, but to literally let your mind wander in the very best sense of the term. Um, I see a cluster of things about attachments and teachers as role models and relationships, and um, wanted to comment on that a little bit. I, I think that um, if personalization works well, there are opportunities to strengthen those kinds of attachments and relationships because Teachers would, in this model, they spend less time standing in front of the whole class and more time working with individuals or small groups of children. So the possibility is there. I, I can't say that we, we know for sure that the, that will strengthen the relationships, but it seems like um, when, when some kids, if you have, have a heterogeneous class and some kids are able to work productively on their own. It frees the teacher to work with the other kids that might need more attention. I want to pick up on your example myself a little bit, John, because it ties into the writing by hand mm -hmm. and the teachers as role models. Mm -hmm. uh, I've recently had an opportunity from the research I did to observe a classroom where the kids do mathematics at the computer quite a bit. But the part of the program in this particular uh, uh, product is to have kids learn how to take their own mathematical notebook. And the teacher spends a lot of time walking around talking about what do you write in your mathematical notebook, how do you use your mathematical notebook, how do you structure your mathematical notebook, 
And so I see the teacher in that classroom having been freed up to do some work that is closer to the self-regulation, self kind of work we're talking about, about working on how do you learn to learn type issues in those classrooms because the technology is so effectively uh, leading them through the, 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 the problem solving aspect. They're, they're productively doing math, now the teacher can work on this actually paper skill. The paper note, how do you take notes? So that, that's a kind of nice example of, that I've seen. Not everyone I've seen is nice. <laughs> that's one. Well, I to, there's an issue in here about keeping classrooms a social space and relationships and teachers as role models. Uh, I sort of build on that because I, I think one of the things that is, it can be effective is to actually recognize that learning is in fundamentally a, a social process as much as it's a cognitive process. And a lot of the learning we do and we do out of school is, is socially mediated. It's mediated by significant others. Uh, we can take a sort of developmental perspective in terms of peers. But I think one of the things with and without technology, what we, what we need to move to is a, a sort of a model where actually the teacher plays the role of learner. One of the things that students need to understand is that everybody learns. And, we can, and teachers can effectively model what it means to learn, to engage in, 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 in metacognition and self-reflection, and model those things, which oftentimes are very implicit um, and not transparent to, to kids. We know that from research. So, and some of this can be supported by technology. It can be mediated by technology. Um, but it doesn't have to, but it really changes the nature of what the classroom environment looks like. The one, I want to also comment on another thing I heard, which is um, there are issues about, in, in, you know, um, well, let's sort of say, inappropriate or ineffective uses of technology. Schools are inundated and districts are inundated by a variety of things that are presses from outside in which they feel like they have to do certain things Part of it's driven by the accountability world that we live in. And, and sometimes we feel like, particularly in the world of assessment, um, that, that schools and districts are being sold a bill of goods by publishers um, on stuff they don't need that's not very effective, not very useful, but they have this sense that of urgency that because we live in a high stakes accountability world, we've got to do a bunch of stuff that is actually counterproductive much of it is mediated by, by technology. Technology is not the evil here. It is a sort of larger social context in terms of presses on schools and teachers and districts in terms of things they have to feel like they have to respond to. Yeah, I'll just to jump off on that point and connect it to sort of the issues about the industry and the commercial sector, which I really appreciated. And, you know, I do think. Uh, you know, there are a lot of ways that you could look at that, right? So there is the policy environment. There is, you know, it's very interesting to think of like an industry, responsible industry group, for example. Uh, you know, one of sort of my pet issues is really to get the tech industry to think about education as the business they're already in uh, versus <laughs> like selling iPads to schools or, you know, you know, a philanthropic, let's start a new school. So like games and social media, Google, these are learning platforms. They are the platforms that kids are learning in every day, but they're not framed as learning platforms within our social imagination. So, you know, if you think about something like Google or YouTube and how frequently all of us use it for our everyday learning, you know, there, there isn't a conversation. It's like Google has an education division that does teacher training on search and, you know, <coughs> things that are in the sector that they define as education. And I think there's a whole conversation you can have that would be quite different that is really about engaging with the core of the tech business and understanding, you know, the account of not the responsibility, the social responsibility that, uh, you know, today's industry has. In, you know, delivering learning experiences for people. And so, you know, we've been doing little things like working with Microsoft on, uh, you know, do, developing Minecraft mods and functionality that uh, fosters the more productive learning dimensions of that environment. You know, there's, uh, 
you know, we're, we've been in talks with platforms like DeviantArt and Wattpad, which are just amazing platforms for kids to publish their creative work. And look, you guys are in the business of education. You know, what would it take to make this easy for teachers to use? What would it uh, take to, you know, recognize some of the work that kids are doing on these platforms as educationally valuable? So. I think there's uh, a lot that can be done, which is about you know positive engagement as well as you know the important sort of regulatory like reining in kind of work. Uh, I think we have to attack it from a lot of fronts. Could I pick up on the writing theme for a second, yeah. uh, from a slightly different perspective, and I'd like to relate it to what we heard several times today about play. If you look at some of the methods of teaching young kids to write rather than just put this implement in your hand, it's trace things on, uh, in sand or on sandpaper, and it's something that is very physically manipulable. Uh, part of the issue with where we're going, and this is a very pr now comparatively primitive version of technology, are you doing word processing as opposed to using your hand? Uh, part of the issue is our brains really are functioning very differently if we are inputting something that is already preformed as opposed to we form it ourselves. So there is a fair amount of research that's coming out now for young kids um, saying if you are forming letters by hand as opposed to um, touching them on an iPad, your reading speed is going to be faster or your, your rate of learning to read is going to be faster um, by doing it by hand. Similarly, um, there are studies that have shown that if you're taking notes by hand, and this is in a university classroom, as opposed to like this, you have to synthesize what is being said as opposed to become a stenographer. And at least there's one study that suggests you do better on the exam if you're writing by hand because you know the sort, you figured out what's important to know. So I think we need to ask what are the pieces of technology piece by piece that make sense for particular kinds of learning and which are the ones that don't. And part of our problem is we're too much of a one size fits all when it says we all have to use tech or we shouldn't use tech. But that's a theme we've heard many times today. I want to speak a little bit to, to that one as well about the writing. Um, I've seen some really nice research-based uses of technology to help kids express mathematical and scientific ideas where, you know, a mouse and a keyboard are actually pretty awful devices for kids to express the early stages of their thinking as they're starting to grasp. Um, but a freehand drawn sketch or writing mathematical notation or drawing a diagram is often quite a powerful way for kids to express their growth and their development along the way. And so I think we also have work we can do in the research not to treat tech all as one thing, but to talk about how some of the changing mo modalities of switching from a mouse and keyboard to the ability to write, the ability to use gesture, and other ways for students to express themselves can better help kids show what, they, what they're understanding as they learn math and science. Do we have any so questions or comments from the audience? Just yeah, good. Just a comment yeah. on that, because that act, that what you just said turns out to be a large problem when we put it in the context of current standardized testing, even the best testing, because in fact, we it, it, for kids to express their mathematical understanding, yeah. they have to go through clunky equation editors when it would be far better if they could just do it the way they do it on paper or graphically. And so there are times when technology can actually get in the way of our ability to actually effectively estimate what kids know what and can do. Know, yeah. And, and you know we can we, that can change over time. There is technology to do it, but when we do certain things at large scale, we end up creating problems that we didn't intend. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and ways in which kids can control digital media as their own way to tell their story of their understanding or express their argument or thinking are, are things we can look to where kids are in, are actually empowered to express via the media. Is there any um, any comments or questions from the audience before we wrap up? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to address the issue of personalization yeah. and um, share some success, a success story. I'm a high school teacher here locally at El Toro High School, and I spent six months at, in Finland learning how they teach problem solving and optimize learning. And I've come back, and now I've started the third year of blending a Finnish and American approach to teaching. And it's been successful with low achievers, high achievers, second language learners, the disabled, and the disengaged. It, by using technology in the appropriate places, and by scaffolding learning, I had a student, students last year tell me 
This helps the low achievers achieve their best and the high achievers achieve, achieve their best. Because by scaffolding lessons in an appropriate way and guiding the learning and creating environments for the kids, they can go as far as they can with you as a teacher helping them along the way as they need it. So thank you for recognizing that. And it's been a huge advance for, for how to use technology and optimizing learning for every child, even in large classes, 36 kids. So for instance, I teach biology, college prep biology, and so for the next generation science centers, they talk about using or teaching about ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so I can say to them, you know, biological principles are similar across ecosystems, so I can say, let's, let's look at different ecosystems, which one would you like to work on? They put themselves in groups. And the Finns would say, um, find out what you think is interesting, what's important to share with the class. American teachers would say, here's a rubric, <laughs> right? And so when you do this for kids, at first they're like, well, what do I look up? Tell me what to look up. And I said, no, really, follow your curiosity, but you need to get to edu.sites you know, um, that, that have value, and you can check with me about the sites. And, and um, so they go off. They, and we, we chose, um, you know, they chose those. We did something with that. We also did um, animals in peril, like um, polar bears, honeybees, and, and gray wolves. And we said, pick the one you'd like. And so they were able to choose which ones they wanted to do. But, what ends up happening is that the children struggle through that, the problem solving process of what's important and what's not. And they end up going much, much further than they would have otherwise if they had just said, here's five facts. Mm -hmm. um, there, we don't have any multiple choice tests. There's no true false, there's no fill in the blank. <laughs> Everything is problem solving. And every day I leave something out. They have to figure things out. So every day they're in that productive struggle and feeling like, oh my gosh, how can I do this? And they get it. And every day they become better and better thinkers. And so at the end of six or seven weeks, because I've restructured this, the curriculum around themes as opposed to chapters, they we interweave the content many times over so the slow learners have a turn chance to, to speed up or to, to catch up. By the time there's assessment, they can write about, you know, their final is five pages of essay questions, where even the kids that have struggled with writing, even with dysgraphia or d dyslexia, they can show me to understand the scientific concepts with giving data, by giving, um, experimental results by sharing the pros and cons, what works, what, what doesn't work, citing people that have done work in other areas. They, they really can come across as being real true thinkers. And so um, I just, so I want to say that I, I know that there are, there are pros and cons of technology, but I will say if, if we allow the, the, the thought about how to teach and how to learn and how to create environments to optimize student learning rather at the pace of the teaching, and not around the test. It's like, let's re rethink how we're doing this. Their results have been astounding. I mean, I just can't even tell you how beautiful it is to watch these kids who haven't been successful in school to turn around and become successful. And there's a, a, a please use this analogy if you want to. I came up with the analogy of a high jump. What we do in American schools is it's oftentimes like, um, here's a high jump, right? Pretend it's a math class. Here's a high jump. By Friday, everyone has to jump over this high. And some kids jump over, some hit the bar, some go over underneath it. But by the next next week, sorry, whatever you did, you get that grade. <laughs> and the next week, we're raising the bar because someone outside my classroom said this is the pace. And if you can't keep up, sorry, you keep failing. Well, some kids might be two weeks behind. In two weeks, they might even get it. And they could. I mean, if the goal is to learn, the pacing isn't important, right? Yep. It's the scaffolding and the opportunities <laughs> and how to build it. So. Um, thank you for letting me share. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>